is the Rex check-in call for March 2019. It's Wednesday, March 13th, and uh, we will kick off with a poem called Carrying a Ladder by Kay Ryan. And it goes as follows. We're always really carrying a ladder, but it's invisible. We only know something's the matter, something precious crashes, easy doors prove impassable, or in the body, there's too much swing or off-center gravity. And in the mind, a drunken capacity, access to out-of-range apples, as though one had a way to climb out of the damage and apology. Let me read it again. Carrying a Ladder by Kay Ryan. We are always really carrying a ladder, but it's invisible. We only know something's the matter, something precious crashes, easy doors prove impassable, or in the body, there's too much swing or off-center gravity, and in the mind, a drunken capacity, access to out-of-range apples, as though one had a way to climb out of the damage and apology. I'll post a link to the poem in our chat. That makes me uh, wonder if I should bribe my children's way into good colleges. I think that's a I think that's a play to do now. Now that it's you know <laughs> kind of out in the open, and the early perps have already done the perp walk. Now, like right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a crazy they, thing, they isn't never it? Never expect the second wave. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> they never expect the second wave. It's a bit of a crazy oh. time. Um, yeah. It's great to see everybody. Matt, welcome to the, to the calls. Nice to have you here. You are muted. You are there, muted. muted. Thank you very much. Oh, you <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for joining. And Kelly tried to explain it to me a little bit, so I was interested in <clears throat> joining and, and seeing what it's all about. Cool. Sounds very interesting and mind expanding and mind opening. Um, well, we'll, we'll try to live up to some small piece of that. Um, the, the Rex thing really goes back to relationships, uh, really goes back to observations about the loss of trust across lots of parts of society and the fact that we've broken relationships in many ways, um, which I attribute a lot to consumerism and the fact that we're all being treated as mere consumers and no longer as citizens or neighbors mm -hmm. or even necessarily people because Consumers are uh, kind of gullets with wallets and eyeballs um, to train up to get more, to buy more stuff. So the relationship economy is a way of studying uh, and maybe implementing all different kinds of things that come from an assumption of trust and assumption of good intent. So from the open source community, you've probably heard the saying, assume good intent, mm -hmm. right? Or assume good faith is another way of, of saying that. That's a principle of Rex. Like uh, it doesn't mean everybody has good intent. It doesn't mean that at all because you can't be naive to sort of walk around in this world being trusting, which may sound weird, but it's true. <laughs> um, but if you start with an assumption that other people are trying to bring good and do good, much better things show up. And uh -huh. I think notably, you build a very different system in reply. Because if you assume that everybody coming in could damage us, could hurt the system, you're gonna build a system that immediately tries to control their behavior and make sure that they all do the same thing and put them in lockstep. So you build kind of controlling institutions. And if you assume that people have good intent and are pretty smart themselves, then you'll build systems that try to release their genius and allow them to collaborate with other people and yet find out where the guardrails are so that everybody's aiming toward the same goal in some way, right? Um, and I think open source communities do this a whole bunch because on one sense, it's a free for all uh, because anybody can take the code and, and run with it and fork it and do all kinds of chaotic things. But on the other hand, we see progress and we see the building of some yeah. common shared asset, which is super interesting. And then, which is also interesting, is we see a whole bunch of companies building businesses and making profits on top of these shared assets in the new mm. commons. So the idea of the commons and the new commons is really important to the relationship economy as well. So those are just some of the, some of the dynamics and some of the inspirations behind uh, why we're in here talking. And the check-in calls are just a way for us to share what's been on our minds that has something to do with these notions. And we start kind of loose anywhere. And it turns out like 
in 20 minutes we're busy like we're down at 500 meters and then like <laughs> after a little while we're busy decompressing trying to come back up and it, it's pretty it's pretty cool that way uh, awesome. so i just wanted to to um maybe we just go around and check in and say like a word or a sentence about what uh, uh what's been going through your head recently just just uh it can just be one word if you'd like but uh let me go to i'll, I'll just call names as we go how about uh bo april uh dave bo do you want to start Come on, but one word. You're, you're, you're muted, so you could even you could pantomime the word. How about that? What kind of word do you want me to guess about? Any word, a word, a Rexy word that's been bouncing around in your head uh, lately. Responsibility. I like that one. Responsibility, good. Um, April, and you're muted. Yeah, everybody's muted coming into this call by default, so you have to unmute to talk. And you're still muted. Cool. Huh. Do you want me to unmute you? Yeah, unmute her. Okay, here we go. Here we go. go ahead. Okay, thank you. My word is, good morning, everybody. My word is collimate. Collimate. I like it. Do you guys know what that means? No, I do not. So it's, um, Column, I'll, I'll send the link, and it's actually thanks to Jerry, but col to collimate means to focus, to, like you would collimate energy or light. If you're developing a laser, you're going to collimate it so that it aligns perfectly. And it's not about the perfection or the alignment as it is the focus. Um, when you collimate energy, that's what allows you to like burn a hole through some material you couldn't do before. So I like it. it a lot. That's my new favorite word. I like that word. That's a we, great word. We could yeah, become collimation call, nation. Collimating, yeah, collimating energy is just my favorite phrase at the moment. So mm. here we go. Uh, Dave, Susan, and Matt. Uh, I think we're replacing trim tab there, April. It's good. Um, <laughs> I've been pondering live online participation. Which is still a thing. I mean, it's still a puzzle, not a solution, right? Exactly. It's not quite a thing. Yeah. We used to call it an online community, but... Yeah, exactly. We may come back to this, and that, that's how I know you, through Forum One, right? I think so. A, a couple moons back. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, Susan? Uh, Work-centric thinking. Can you say just a tiny bit more? Yeah, we talk about work. When we talk about work, we talk about the workplace, the workforce, the work, everything except the work itself. Interesting. And have you seen there's an essay recently about how work ate, ate our world? I'm not sure I've seen that one. I will hunt for it when we're done sort of going through, but um, I'll do it. Uh, April, if you remember which one it was, mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting. Basic, basically, we've made work completely central to our lives. We took we take the best hours of our lives, we put them into work. We think of everything as relating to work. Education has become training for work. Everything feeds work and it's not made room for actually our, our normal lives. <clears throat> um, Except that the work has been making everything work. Yeah. Not the work. Sure. And total work, exactly. Workism, all those words, exactly. Uh, Matt? Uh, value of demand, but as it relates to sharing knowledge, Kelly and I had a discussion yesterday that made me start thinking about our demand models, but for knowledge and information, not consumerism that popped back into my head when you were explaining kind of the relationship economy and the demand of knowledge versus a consumer product mm -hmm. driving behavior. So, um, and by demand, do you mean how often things come up as requests in a query system? What, what sorts of demand do you mean? When people are looking for knowledge, do they understand the knowledge they're looking for? Do they understand the demand they have to grow and consume more knowledge? Um, obviously, a lot of our work is around knowledge and sharing knowledge and how that impacts services. but based on discussions that I've had with Brad and Kelly, it's making me think about kind of those words differently than maybe I did before engaging this community. 
That's very cool. And sometimes coming into something, we don't know what to ask because we don't know the shape of the thing we're coming mm. into. And so, so we don't know how to phrase even our request. Partly, we may not know the lingo of the domain mm. we're in. If it's you know, aeronautics or yep. finance or whatever, it's got, it's got jargon and language. But then, the, but then there's always sort of nuance underneath it. Like under the hood, it's always more complicated than we think it is sort of looking in. So there's all those aspects to it. Cool. Love that. Um, Todd, Mark? Uh, theme of responsibility has come up a lot the last couple of weeks. Uh, and particularly re-envisioning corporate social responsibility. Uh, I'm not sure that responsibility is a tricky word. Um, responsibility is a lovely word. Um, I think, for some reason, I think of responsibility as a bipartisan word. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a word somewhere in the middle space that's not highly politicized by either side and that attracts discussion about important issues from both sides, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and I'm putting it in a, in a political framing because it has lots of other framings as well. But, but it's, it's kind of a middle of the roadish kind of word that matters to, to most everybody, I think. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Mark, then Brad, then Kelly. Um, distrust. And, and maybe for context, uh, I've been kind of noticing that quite a lot on, uh, like, he, I'm in Canada, so there's been this whole thing with Prime Minister Trudeau and his former Attorney General, and there's been considerable erosion of trust happening there, and actually very interesting dynamics, which I, some of which I've watched. Um, on a local level, uh, you know, working with this organization called How We Thrive here in Nova Scotia, um, last year it was a program, and th there was... I, th I thought fantastic uh, participation by the indigenous peoples, by some of, some of the other early w waves of immigration to Nova Scotia, such as the Scots and Gael Gaelics and so on. But in, in preparing for next this coming session, there's uh, you know this whole kind of pushback from some communities saying, "Hey, who are you, white privileged people, blah blah blah, to be doing this?" And so maybe the closer you come to something, the more opportunity there is to get bitten by this. And uh, so there's this kind of paradox. And I could say more, but that's enough. Probably. There's just tons under that subject. Thank you, Mark. That's, yeah, that, that's a really rich, uh, a really rich topic. Um, Brad, what's on your, on your mind in this realm? Well, I kind of, yeah, you know, I shared with you my recent reading. So uh, I would have to say behavioral futures market. And the fact that more and more we're scraping human experience as a raw material so that we can plug it into machine learning to predict what people want and then also to influence what people want at the individual level and at the societal level. That's kind of scary, especially knowing that I hands-on helped contribute to this uh, newfound industry <laughs> over my career for the past 25 years. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, oh, shucks, moment for me. Damn it. Totally understand that. Thank you. And uh, I, I, those of you who've seen me at the consortium um, know that the, one of my favorite phrases is stock or serve. And right. I think we're at a moment where people don't realize that a lot of what they're doing is, in fact, stalking behavior. Um, and there's the term, the stalker economy. Shoshana Zuboff just published uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, all of this is basically the machine that we're, we're, we're in up to now. But to be of service, and I think this is big for, for the consortium, to be of service, I need your info too. Like, mm -hmm. I need to understand what your configuration is, what we talked about last time. I need to be able to pick up the threads so that I can very efficiently um, do the work for you, and that requires me to hold some info. So how do you, and, and the difference between, you know, stalking and serving mm -hmm. is one of trust and intention and relationship and responsibility and a lot of the other words that are, that are showing up here. So I think that's a really, that's a lovely place to, to poke. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Kelly. I've been um, thinking a lot about uh, curious or critical. Those are, those are sort of the words that I've been noodling on lately because I can either be one or the other in any given situation and I can't be both. And if I'm being curious, then I'm, then I'm able to 
see connections and be in the moment with people and um, uh, and just and be curious about things. But if I'm being critical, then that that's it's sort of a fear based shut it down um, sort of that that will never work kind of mind frame. And so j I'm sort of playing around with I, I think that's true. I think I can either be curious or I can be critical. I don't think I can be both at, at once, um, which is not to say that there isn't also a time for, you know, good judgment, right? The, I don't mean critical in terms of assessing rationally, <laughs> but mm -hmm. that's what I've been thinking about. That's cool. And um, curiosity is an underrated word at work, mm -hmm. I think, right? We sort of want people who are going to stay on task and do the thing and meet their OKRs and all that kind of stuff. And we're sort of trying to fence people so that there's a, there's a, a known high thing they have to jump over for the next time box. And, mm -hmm. and if they start wandering from that, we get a little worried. And curiosity is about the wandering mm -hmm. in some sense, right? Yeah. Um, so I think there's not a lot of uh, a lot of room made made for that. Um, there was an observation made by someone, uh, Jeff Nunberg, for those of you who follow NPR and Terry Gross, um, <laughs> when he got to work at Xerox, that there was lots of technology for writing and none for reading. Interesting. Super interesting. Um, let me ask a question that's kind of in the middle of some of these topics. Um, and Susan, you were saying that we sort of don't see the work. Um, and I, I, I want to absorb better what you mean by that. But is one reason we don't see the work that maybe sometimes it runs against our values, the work we're supposed to do? It, it's like, eh, I have to do this thing, but I don't really want to look at it and inspect it and unpack it because I'm, I'm busy contributing to the stock or economy or whatever else. Is that one of the things that play or do you mean something completely different? I think I mean something completely different. Okay. Uh, but I have, and I don't, I don't know, I, have, I don't have good words. So I'm just, I'm working on this um, as it were. Um, I think, I think what's the, um, what I'm thinking about is the shape, the shape and the structure of the work that we do and whether we, we think about it as a task or whether we think about it, whether we actually, when we're thinking about, I think the focusing on the works means that, you know, you would, when you're designing a facility, you might, you might actually try to figure out what the work people are doing and what the dimensions of that work are. Um, so five or six of them, but one, just for an example is, you know, is it something that one does on one's own? Is it something that you're doing? Um, in a team, is it something that you're doing? You know, where are you doing it? All of those different dimensions. Um, is it, uh, you know, does it have purpose? Um, in, in that sense, you can put that in there. And and those dimensions then draw should be driving uh, some of the design decisions mm -hmm. for for actually how we structure the work, for actually how we build it with the tech, not particularly the technology. Um, yeah. And I think, I think I'm aiming in the right direction to add the complication that you're interested in physical workspaces as well as virtual workspaces. <clears throat> and so the shaping of the work online is as important to you as, as off. To wit, I happen to have brought a book. No way. What, what's, what's this book thing? I, I, I don't recognize books. <laughs> <laughs> This one says, how designers and architects created the digital landscape. Hmm. It's architectural okay. intelligence. And it's, it's starting to, to cross over between the physical and the virtual, which I've decided is a false dichotomy in the way we usually think about it. Yeah. Uh, so that's part of the, absolutely part of the, the picture. Who are the authors? Uh, the author is Molly Wright Steenson. Oh, Molly. Okay, that's right. You know her? Uh, yes, I've met her. Uh-huh. And uh, the architects are the usual, uh, there are three of them you might, I recognize. Christopher Alexander, hmm. Nic Nicholas Negroponte, Richard Saul Werman, and Cedric Price. And they're, uh, it's, it's quite, it's, 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 it's thorough, you know, it's thick. <laughs> <laughs> 
But that, yeah, because I am, uh, yes. And I'm <laughs> supposed to give a talk in a few weeks um, about <laughs> this idea. So I'm, 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 I'm grappling with it, trying to run it to the ground. Interesting. Um, so here's um, architectural intelligence. Here's Molly yep. in my brain. Uh, she and I both spoke at Reboot 2008. Uh -huh. um, so that's where we first met. Yep. Um, her Twitter account is Maxi Molly, and uh, she's at the Carnegie Mellon School of Design. Yep. Which is one of many design schools. So is Cameron Tonkin wise. I didn't realize that. And here's a bunch of design schools. <laughs> a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I collect. Um, let's, I think it might be useful to go back to curiosity for a second. And just um, Kelly and April, if you don't mind riffing a little bit on what your intentions are in your quest into curiosity, that I think we could um, maybe help with those. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, good. Um, so I've just been really fascinated by work I've done recently around the future of work. Um, but also, last weekend, Jerry knows this, I gave my first keynote um, to a group of educators. Uh, I really wanted to reach K-12 K through 12 educators. So I've really wanted to uh, speak with younger audiences. I I've done some work at universities, but really looking at, you know, not to make it all about work or total work, but you know, the, what we need to be preparing for starts young. And the, the world of work, the different options available and all of that. And so I started sort of backing up and I think all of us on the call would agree that um, you know, curiosity is one of the skills that the current education system is extraordinarily good at stamping out and yet we've never needed it more than today. So if you're training, if you're building a system that's good for factory workers and soldiers, you want them to obey orders, you want them to not question, you want them to not be curious. But we've really got ourselves in a bit of a mess at the moment. And so I started exploring it and looking into it. And basically, and this isn't, you know, by no means rocket science. It's, it, for me, it just felt like a very simple aha, which is, we focus on, so many people, it's like, well, what are you curious about? What are you curious about? And then follow that through. And that's important. But I'm realizing, like, the super skill is simply curiosity itself. I, could, I care far less about what you're curious about than that you know how to identify what fascinates you, follow it through, and nurture that over time. And do that again and again and again, and then it's relentless. And so that led me to kind of start peeling back the layers of the onion, looking at the etymology of it, looking. And so the piece that I'm teeing up to write is it, like, it's this word that we throw out almost like a tagline these days, which I'm not going to, you know, I'm glad that it's showing up more in conversation, but like, do we really know what we're talking about? And what did it, um, you know, what's the Latin? What, how was it interpreted in medieval times? Um, when we hear about, you know, curiosity has uh, these days um, in some in some conversations, you know, it's a very alluring, fascinating, neat topic. Um, people who were curious in the past were usually, you know, another version of curiosity or being curious is that like you're odd. You're a bit of an outsider. You're a bit eclectic. It's sort of stigmatized. Then we think about things like curio cabinets. So if you were curious, you had a curio cabinet of like interesting eclectic things. And so I'm just sort of at this point doing research um, back here, here in my office. That's, yeah. that's your curio cabinet. Sweet. <laughs> curio cabinet. Well, and the, you know, in the digital world, we can we still have obviously digital collections, but a lot of the ways in which we might have thought about curiosity manifesting in the past isn't happening to the same degree. You know, museums, yes, but um, fewer of those such things hanging on your wall. So um, anyway, I'm just in research mode, and um, you know, obviously, I'm going to draw some practical recommendations, but like going down that rabbit hole has actually been really, really fun and candidly quite comforting because it's a skill that we all need that I think kids, kids, people of all ages need it, but like it's going to be table stakes for kids um, to succeed. And so how do we, how do we just sort of get people to understand the concept? Because in my experience, it feels like it's a term that people 
throw out without really understand or without having developed, um, how do I say, like a, a black belt in curiosity um, itself. So I'll pause there. It, I'm sure you've seen and read uh, the, um, I had it right on the tip of my brain. Uh, Sounds like a more perfect question, a more beautiful question. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and have you, I don't know if you've dove into any of the stuff that the Right Question Institute is working on. They're, they are uh, formed very much like the consortium um, and are all about helping people ask better questions. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they, they are very um, focused on K through 12 that they do a ton of resources for educators. Yeah, and, okay, that's great. I, I'm familiar with it, but from, from before I was prepping for this keynote, so it's actually really good. Yeah. Back from a, re from a, a resources perspective. Yeah, awesome. We have tried, they, so they have a, um, a sort of facilitation method, uh, which I can't, I think it's called the, I call it something different when I do it. It's, it's called like the questioning, methodology or something like that. But um, we've done it a couple times with consortium groups in which we, um, you state a question focus and then you spend five or seven minutes going around the room asking all the questions you can think about it. And it's taken us a couple sort of iterations to figure out if this is um, sort of how it, this exercise can be the most helpful. But it turns out that if, when you spend five minutes just asking questions and writing them all down, it, it, it has a tendency to sort of, once you look at those questions afterwards, they kind of organize into kind of meta categories or, you know, larger. We end up getting sort of four or five interesting collections of questions. This is about, these sets of questions are sort of more about um, how we might approach this problem. And these sets of questions are more about who's going to be impacted by this problem. It's been a really interesting um, thing to play with, right? Which is when we, I think we've done it maybe two or three times and, and this a little bit gets back to the curiosity piece and, and from my own personal perspective in which it feels a little scary because we've never, we had met when we first did it, we'd never done it before. And are people gonna, is this gonna resonate? Is it gonna work? That whole, that whole piece. Um, all we're gonna do is sit around and ask questions and people are like, I don't, I don't understand what we get out of this. And then to have it turn around and be like, oh, this completely organized our thinking about sort of this focus that we laid out at the beginning was, was quite gratifying. And um, so, so then to kind of like loop this all the way back around, right? Um, <laughs> I just saw a tweet from Adam Grant that was basically like, we, um, we, something about, we really lose an opportunity to aim for excellence when we're worried about how good, how good we're looking, right? If we, can, if we can just let go of sort of whether or not we look good, then we can get some practice in, in the things that we really wanna be doing. And so, um, so that's, that for me is also kind of that baseline of the curiosity and being, and being open to not looking good all the time, which mm -hmm. happily I'm fairly comfortable being a goofball. <laughs> so. Um, letting, letting go. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. And I love this. This is great. Um, and I'm also in the moment you remind the moment you say that as well, I'm immediately reminded also of, um, sounds maybe a little bit hokey, but the yoga mat, which is all about this where it's like, and if you aim for perfection, like the whole point of the practice, uh, I shouldn't say the whole point. One of the points of the practice is, you know, to find that balance between ease and effort, but like to just let go because, you will never be everything that you want to be on that mat. But, and, and if you keep thinking, I have to get perfection again, in this case, in a pose, you're never actually going to get to excellence. You're never going to get to that next step of, you know, flexibility or strength or whatever. So it's, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Anybody else? Thoughts on metaphor. It? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyone else with thoughts on, on curiosity and, and the way we're intending it here? Go ahead, Red. I, I was reflecting on uh, being, you know, uh, always curious. And I recognize that um, it's actually a key element to, I think, tenacity. Um, mm. Because as you're growing up K to 12, you know, I've, I've been blessed to raise 
two generations of kids. I have my 1.0 family and my 2.0 family. And um, the, the first generation, uh, Noah, my son, uh, was a super bright, could grasp concepts very, very quickly. So school was always easy for him. New things were always easy for him. And as soon as he hit a roadblock, he would decide, I don't want to do this. This isn't for me. And then his mom would swoop in and uh, save the day through helicopter parenting. Um, so now he's 29. And, uh, you know, he's got a real fulfillment challenge in his life because he's never truly accomplished anything on his own and never really pushed through and pushed, pushed, pushed until finally achieving this thing. And, and you know, it dawns on me that there's a delta between curiosity and boredom, you know, filling the vacuum of stuff versus being truly curious and wanting to master it, and figure it out and kind of kind of see it through. So. Um, I think there's a thread there. And, and if I think to my own journey, um, if you live a curious life where you're seeking out multiple curiosities, let's say, um, it kind of gives you the ability to live your life on multiple narratives, right? There's, there's work Brad and there's church Brad and there's second time parenting Brad and there's, you know, particle physics Brad. And these different curiosities allow me to explore things at a different time cycle. And, and oftentimes, you know, in, and for those the consortium who know me, you know, I'll jump into a new job opportunity fully knowing this is probably not a good fit, but I'm here to figure out this very particular thing and I'll, I'll run this job as long as the job will have me. But my real pursuit is to actually understand and master this particular thing because I know future Brad's really going to be grateful that present Brad did this thing. And it's a great way to survive, you know, uh, the drudgeries of a shitty job and to uh, be able to, you know, deal with swarms of antibodies that you're undoubtedly going to, you know, trigger as you try to do new and interesting and provocative things. So I think curiosity is, is absolutely a life skill and it ought to be nurtured early on and it ought to be explored. Yeah, this is great. And, and I fully agree. And what's interesting is I feel like it's never, it's not that society generally has been like, don't be curious. Like, like parents want their kids to be curious timelessly, but the education system has like systematized that out of being a priority. And from well, my it's perspective- hard, It's hard to set a standardized test against, right? Exactly. Yeah. But we've now gone to, so far overboard and now everyone's trying to figure out how do we claw back some of that ground that was lost. And you know, just from the perspective of, I know many of you have seen this as well, where, um, you know, not just the pace of change, but like how fast are skills possibly going to become obsolete? And I'm not talking, you know, I don't want to be a doomsday, like we're all going to be replaced by robots. We don't need to go down that path even so far as to say it is true that a lot of skills that are deemed important today weren't deemed important five years ago and skills that are important today will be, you know, off the radar in five years. So that sense of curiosity is being just such a necessary part of one's DNA because I love, like, like you, Brad, I'm, you know, naturally curious, but for those who aren't or for those, for those who've had it stamped out, it's something that we need. We've always had this skill, but we need to find it again. Yeah. yeah. Well, we need to have some time. Hmm? We need to have time. Hmm. to do that to do that yeah, yeah. And, and it's not like be curious at four o'clock after school precisely right right yeah this is not the time slot for curiosity you that right? during russian math before swim team but after volleyball that's the time <laughs> yeah exactly the irony that that um that the bell could ring and mm, curiosity time's over would be like yeah, the antithesis. One thing I will bring up, though, and this was in my research for the keynote, it was just very fun to see how schools are tackling this um, in different countries around the world. And, and in fairness, I found it fascinating. This was in Europe, um, not surprisingly, but schools that had actually established, created student-led units on curiosity. Mm. So that they actually study the concept and then they do to, you know, apply it in different ways. But they're being deliberate about learning about it as opposed to a term that we just sort of throw around and, uh, you know, don't necessarily explain. So, mm -hmm. interesting. Well, maybe we could have, maybe a skill for parents is curiosity spotting. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Well, so a little bit, I'm sort of like, yeah, but have you spent time with a four-year-old? Like this, this is not actually a problem for four-year-olds. <laughs> well, yes, but something between the ages of four and 10 and 15. So yeah, for sure. So, what do you want to be when you grow up? You can be anything. By 10, that window has just narrowed. And by 15, 95% of those early options are gone. So you're absolutely right. But there's something that happens the moment they start, I think, roughly primary school. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. It's done. And, but so it feels like a system in which we are naturally inclined to be one way, but we went ahead and built a system to, to go ahead and stifle that, right? Which is exactly, so the consortium is about to um, release the intelligence warming framework for collaboration, which is a way for support agents who have always naturally collaborated, but we've put systems and processes in place to make them not do that. The, the intelligence warming framework is going to provides the path to build a collaborative support environment. Right. And so I'm pretty excited about kind of getting some words around lots of companies um, who participate with the consortium have been have been playing with this idea in which we can get, you know, swarms of people to work on a problem instead of going off and trying to hammer this out ourselves and then escalating it and then never finding out the answer again. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be on the swarm and, and find, you know, listen to what the answer is as we discover it all together. Um, it's a great way to upskill people. It's a great way to have people feel like they're part of a team. It's a great, like all these things in which we finally maybe are attempting to build a system that reflects how we are naturally wanting to be in relationship with each other, which is, feels exactly sort of parallel to this problem. We, mm -hmm. we, are t we totally come out super curious and then we have gone ahead and imposed a structure that, that beats mm. that out of us. And now how do we walk it back? So. Well, and I, I often wonder, uh, does this man in the, in the business environment, in the corporate environment, is this stamping out of curiosity also manifesting itself in the fear of failure that people have where mm. I'm afraid to fail so I'm not willing to try and push boundaries because curiosity is about attempting and failing and attempting and correcting. So I'm interested if those two things actually are very related and manifesting themselves in these corporate environments. No, I think, I think you're onto something there, Matt. I know I've spent a lot of time with my, my customer experience clients over the past couple of years trying to build uh, customer centric cultures where Every touch point owner from the marketing to sales to service to renewal to repurchase, whatever, you know, that, that continuum, they're all persistently curious about the customer experience, mm -hmm. wanting to know more, learn more, be more insightful, more intuitive, more thoughtful. Um, and then also create curiosities on better, you know, behind the curtain, backstage work processes to make the work easier and better to do. Um, all that backstage work, highly, highly influenced by the work of the consortium, as you could imagine, but building curiosity, a persistent curiosity about the customer and understanding that, you know, if you're going to commit your company to the pursuit of customer experience, you're going to always be running up a down escalator because the experience is always getting incrementally better for everyone mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I think there is something there and it's a, it's a really tough thing to grow into a culture because Everybody's held accountable to the strategic plan, to the shareholder expectations, to the, you know, the current, you know, business objectives that you're granted in your annual review. And you want to measure that with precision and you want to have clarity of when I've crossed the finish line. Mm -hmm. But curiosity is a never ending pursuit. So I, I, I do yeah. think you're onto something there. One thing um, I used to say this in speeches long ago, but um, beware the customer centric company because often that means that they have the customer centered squarely in the crosshairs <laughs> of an elaborate and expensive device designed to shake more money from their pockets. And yeah. this goes right back to stock or serve, which, which is like the intention behind customer centricity. So, um, you know, we're busy trying to maximize cust CLV, customer lifetime value, by which we mean the value of that person to us, the business. We don't mean the value of our service to the customer. We don't mean that. That is not actually in the maths. Right. That's, well, so that's a really interesting, I had, I had not ever gone down that road because from 
when, because as we come from it, from a perspective of support, what we actually want is our customer actually to be successful, right? We have no skin in the revenue game with some exceptions around the actual customer success and retention and renewals and blah, blah, blah. But, but from sort of a traditional support perspective, we would really like them to be successful in part. So they stop maybe calling us so often, (laughs) right? (laughs) How can we set them up for success truly so that they can be successful? So I have not, you're to- I can you're totally right and I can totally see how that perspective in the wrong hands is it's all about getting all your money yeah right? I, not about their success all your money are belong to us yeah no right. no, no I, and, and I, I I take your word to heart for sure um a lot of the work that the consortium has done and inspired me is, is around the understanding of what is value what is the nature mm-hmm. of value and value in the eyes of the customer that you want to support. And if it's a B2B, then, you know, how do I help that business help their customers be realize more value? Um, and then understanding that value is a virtuous cycle, that it's almost a physical property that always has benefits from all parties that are sharing in the invoking of value to be realized. Um, the business benefits will be, you know, the backside of the pursuit of what a, a customer truly values. Um, so trying to drive a value conversation and how well do we understand our customers and what they value and what's the job they're trying to get done and the tasks they're trying to get done and what are all the different options and how hard is it to, to realize that value and how are we contributing to value realization or value erosion? Like that's, that's where I lay down uh, a lot of my, my thinking, which makes me an outlier because I'm not just going straight to the bottom line. Is it hard um, to find time for that conversation? I, they, you know, what's funny is that it's my opening salvo. <laughs> I, I do my best to scare the children right up front. Nice. nice. And, and <laughs> you're, you're, like, you're, you're going to hire me. I'm not a censured KPMG, you know, uh, uh, PwC. I'm, I'm Brad and I have the lessons learned through my incredible life and you're doing it wrong. So let me explain it to you. And I put a link in the chat to the value stack. There's a real short paper um, about the value stack and sort of the things that from the consortium standpoint, we think enable companies to move up the value stack. And the value conversation is super interesting. I mean, it it, it can get, um, I'd love to hear, you know, any stories you remember from, from these conversations over time, because, um, value, wealth, all those kinds of words are not words we consider very often. Mm. So, so our, our, it's like the word trust. I, I've discovered since I've realized I'm focusing on trust that most people think they have an understanding of trust, but the moment you kind of scratch at the idea, it's like, mm, not so much, you know, not really happening. Well, something, something that, um, there was a great story. There was a working session at the consortium, I think two years ago, up in the, the hinter region of Maine during the summer. And uh, we asked all the participants, tell us the greatest uh, proactive, you know, predictive outreach service experience you've ever had, right? And we had a lot of fails and we had a lot of examples of the soccer economy and that sort of thing. But one of the best stories was, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she- Libby uh, Healy. I, there you go. She, she owns a farm, <laughs> a small little farm in a tiny town 45 miles west of where we were, um, and she was out there, you know, tossing hay, which is, you know, when you harvest the hay and you roll it into bales, and it's, it's dirty, dirty work because there's a lot of critters that kind of use the hay for a good many things. And uh, so she's out there, it's about 4.30 in the afternoon, and she's hot and, you know, dirty, and all of a sudden her cell phone rings. And so she looks at her cell phone and she answers the phone, and uh, we'll call him Al, and Al called and said, hey, you know, I see, I see you out there tossing hay, and I'm wondering if you thought about dinner yet. And she says, no, I haven't. She said, well, would you like me to make you a pizza? You know, you're, you're, you're the regular, and I can have it sitting there ready for you to go at 6.30. How's that sound? She says, oh, my God, that's amazing. That, I would love that. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And she hangs up the phone. But as you break down that story, right, the first thing is, why would you answer your phone if your hands are literally full of, you know, and so first she had to recognize who it was and the relationship of her to him motivated her to answer the phone at that particular time when it's highly inconvenient for her. As soon as she answered the phone, 
he rewarded that relationship by saying, I'm driving by, I'm seeing you, I know exactly what it's like to do what you're doing. I know you probably haven't thought about dinner and sitting close to dinner time. And out of courtesy, I'm going to offer you this thing that I know you value. And then she's overwhelmingly, yes, oh my God, that would be a fantastic, thank you so much, right? But what does this entire thing require to do, you know, at, at scale? And it requires trust, it requires relationships, it requires relevancy, it requires understanding her and her journey and what's next in her journey. I mean, the intimacy required is massive, but that intimacy was granted over years of building a relationship. You know, so if she got a call to refinance her house at that moment in time, would she have answered the phone? Probably right. not. Right. Exactly. And, and the, the piece of this that I'm wrestling with these days a bit is in the face of GDPR and other sorts of privacy protections and the tech lash against Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and everything else, which is completely justified. Are we walling off? companies' abilities to hold our information in trust with an agreement that is, that, that is being used beneficially? Are, are we sort of somehow breaking that ability even because we're busy passing a whole bunch of laws that will prohibit the, the, that kind of thing? And then in the middle of that comes this big, complicating, interesting factor of the decentralized web, which is an attempt to take all that personal data and store it so that we get to hold it and release it only as we want to need to which is super complicated. Like, like the moment you, you know, pull the tarp off that one, you're like, oh, geez, that, that gets really complicated really fast. Um, so uh, are, are you guys walking into the decentralized web part of this as you go into KCS and other kinds of consortium applications? Not yet. We've yeah. talked a lot about, <laughs> we've talked a lot about Doc Searles and, you know, work. Um, but no, we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't done any experimentation and innovation in that neck of the woods just yet. Cool. It's, I, I'm sure it's on your horizon somewhere. Yeah. But I think going back to what you were saying earlier, it's, it is this dichotomy that we're setting up where I need you to know things about me in order to make it easier for me to interact with you electronically. And, and where is that boundary of what I'm, and the problem is today, I don't get to decide what I give up or don't give up. Like I, I have almost no control over how much I'm willing to let you know about me. You know far more about me than I probably even realize you know about me. But I don't, it's, and I think this is what you were saying, you don't want to peel back this layer of, well, if you know nothing about me, every time I come into your website, I'm going to have to go through lots of hoops to get back in there. And it's a very interesting making my head hurt to think through how that might look in the future. One of, one of, the, one of the best applications I've heard uh, to date about smart contracts and blockchain was a uh, Asian uh, insurance company and using their smartphone app and blockchain, um, they give you an instantaneous transfer of funds for a payment of a claim for a particular uh, hospitalization policy they have. So if you're in the emergency room and you process your claim on the cell phone, which is nothing more than taking a photograph of the receipt, it maps who you are, your user ID of the app, your geographical location, the date timestamp of the sequence, it maps it directly back to your smart contract it, it, and it pays the claim and transfers the funds instantly, right? And so that type of customer experience is profound. It's a massive disruptor in the insurance market, as you can imagine, where, you know, it doesn't require fax machines. But it does require this safe and systematic logic that's lockstep through the blockchain and the different technical attributes, right? So, you know, when you sign up for that account, you are forfeiting known fields of information, but the benefit is so massive, the value proposition is so massive, and the value realization is so huge that you know, you're happy to do that every time. That's interesting. Um, Todd, I apologize. I think I didn't come back to you for what, you, what was on your mind, and I also wanted to ask right now, do you want to describe you so? Sure. Uh, so I've been working with this, this uh, startup uh, that came from a colorectal surgeon uh, who, while practicing in Southern California, just got fed up 
with uh, the insurance system, um, time being taken up with billing, not treating customers well. Uh, and so he started a, um, an inquiry into what are ways that I could help customers pay for surgery uh, without, well, bypassing insurance. Uh, and he came across the age old concept of risk sharing pools um, and built a model uh, that is subscriber based uh, and has is all cash pricing um, where if you need a procedure, um, you have a guide uh, that looks at national and regional averages and you can pay cash on the spot for whatever procedure you need. Um, and the way that those the money is dispensed is by concentric circles of groups and then the whole network being able to absorb that cost. So if somebody has surgery in Houston um, and it's a very expensive surgery, I might pay two cents next month. Um, because that might be shared across the entire network. And one thing I love about it is the incentives that are built in. What it means is that all USO is, is a platform that is, is helping determine lower costs, but there's no incentive uh, to take a cut because they only make money on the subscription fees. Uh, and they're really thinking now about what are other ways um, that people can share risk uh, across a network outside of health insurance? Right now they're doing um, community-based pet care. Uh, the human health insurance will, is, is still it, probably a year away, um, but they're seeing all of these potential applications of essentially de-institutionalizing risk. Um, making that a peer to peer uh, or peer to many um, and they they just play the role of facilitating it. That's super interesting. It's a really interesting model and they're doing pet care now partly just because they needed some less controversial space than trying to replace normal insurance for humans to try this out and to see if there was a market, to see if people understood the concept, to see how the moving parts would fit together, et cetera. So right now it's, it's uh, you can insure your pets, um, but in doing so you join a group, you this, you that, and, and you, you, you know, um, it's, it's really quite interesting. And, and, and the larger picture is risk pooling for anything. I, I haven't looked this up, but I feel like some time ago I heard something about there were like mutual funds in Italy that were experimenting with the same thing in which you, you invest with a group of 10 people who you don't know, but it's, it's not mutual funds, retirement funds or like their social security net or something like that. And so because most likely all 10 of you are not going to live the same amount of time. And so every like right as sort of people are passing away, the, then the pool of money that you've invested into remains or something like like it was sort of seemed like the same idea. But boy, you better hope that you really don't know who those other people in your pool are is what <laughs> seemed to me. <laughs> it seems like there's got to be a risk pooling problem in here somewhere, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, insurance companies have some wisdom to them, so, yeah. Well, I mean, the original insurance companies were mutual aid societies where people just pooled some money, right? Um, all and then there was the demutualization of most insurance companies so that they became big corporations. And then what happened to them is what happened to education and, and other sort of domains, which is the administrative part of it kind of ate the rest of it. And then profit making took over the parts of the margin. So part of, I think, what we're seeing in peer-to-peer -peer insurance is the, the, the deconstruction of insurance back to some of its roots. Then the question is, what are the algorithms in the middle there? How big is your pool? What is your group? How, does, how do larger risks get shared out? And I don't know the, the, you know the technical answers to those for USO or any of these other players, but, but you know, the devil is in those details because that's a few bad experiences there and you go under. Mm -hmm.
So what other things does this put any of us in mind of? This puts me in mind of, um, and Kelly may have already read this, but there's a paper um, done in, in the service science world in 19, I mean 19, listen to me. <laughs> in the last millennium? <laughs> so uh, in 2012, um, by Irene Ng and a woman who, L.A. Smith, whom I don't know, and uh, Stephen Vargo. Anyway, it's a, um, an integrative framework of value. And, and it's probably the most, the most mind-changing um, paper I've read in weeks, months maybe. Um, but it does try to unpack the notion of the co-creation of value. Oh. And customer experience and all the rest of that, and it it does so by borrowing a concept from uh, some some branch of psychology I'd never even heard of, um, which was about p consciousness and a consciousness. And oh. Kelly, does this ring a bell? I I have not read it. Well, it it anyway, read it. <laughs> read I will it right, right now. Give us the reference again. Yeah, we'd like to research it. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I was just trying. To <clears throat> This one. Okay. And oh, cool. um, basically the idea is that there's the, there's the, the co-creation of value in the moment of using it. So there's that part of service science, right? That's been right. around for a long time. Uh, then there is, there's sort of on both ends of it, something else uh, it could be part of the customer experience as well, but it's distinguished by not having the thing in front of you. And it's about anticipated value. I think I talked about the distinction between value and worth before. Oh. So anticipated value and whether or not it meets your expectations. And then on the back end, whether it's sort of my, this is my shorthand, uh, about evaluation, sort of what was that, was it worth it? Ooh, yeah. Uh, and that those things are t temporally distinct, of course. I mean, it seemed like such common sense. How come we don't talk about it? But the implications it had for metrics, uh, for actually designing the customer journey or experience, mm. seemed to me profound. Mm. And they already, Brad, they already wrote the paper. And they already no. wrote the paper. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, been, uh... wow. You know, they wrote it like what? 2012, yeah. years ago, I just caught up. So anyway, in my one, because yeah. um, I'm, I'm a real, I'm a real sort of aficionado, I think, maybe stronger than that, um, of the idea of value create co-creation in use, um, no matter whether it's virtual or physical or any of those other things. So I just think it straightens out a whole lot of puzzles. Oh that seem not, so it's called an integrative framework. And it, re it pulls in a lot of the design research. It just sort of pulls in worlds that I know that never have been pulled together before. Nice. Yeah. Can you, talk, can you riff a little bit on the kinds of uh, things that untangles for you? Um, well, I mean, in, in particular, what the, what the customer, uh, well, the details of how the value is co-created. Okay, the fact that it's temporally limited Mm -hmm. uh, that um, that it exists independently conceptually, right? It's a you know one of those distinguishable but not separable things. Um, so it was just and sorting out that and co-production, mm -hmm. uh, which is create you know co-producing value or co-producing a document or co-producing all of these different things, which is not the same thing as the construction of value, which is the co-construction of value, which is in that, in that discussion back a little bit ago in terms of, um, you know, uh, um, customer help, all that, all that whole space. Um, that, call, that phone call, if you, if you think of it as being the co-construction of value, together, the two people in the uh. conversation, then I think the conversation goes a little bit differently. Uh -huh. So my, my research, my, my curiosity passion project over the past five years, I guess, has been this whole notion of the only way value is understood or realized or appreciated is in the moment of the interaction. So it definitely has this co-creation element to it. And that interaction could be me to a device 
Yep. Me to a service, me to a person, right? But it's it's this act of intention that allows, you know, this stuff to unfold. And what I've done is I've I've built a, a map that you have to navigate through these, I call them value gates, right? And when you're confronted with a value gate, um, you you take a moment, you pause, and you consider the situation, and you decide to go through that gate and act right. on what's being right. presented to you, right. or you decide to bail and don't act, or you might even decide to react and, and tell the social media universe, this is a really crappy experience, and I'm not going to stand for it. Right. But, but this idea of, you know, at the very beginning of that journey, right. I, I am using everything I know to be true about my personal experience, about right. my, my Yelp scores, whatever, to even go through that first door. Right. And then once I'm through that first door and I'm in the lobby, now I'm considering the value proposition of all the different interaction cho- choices and paths I have in front of me. And I'm going to pick the one that I feel is best for me based again upon my psychological scomas that have been yeah. tuned through. All so there's a nice, this is a nice way of bracketing. That experience, and, right? then as I, as, and then finally, I navigate doing. through that through that next door. And now I'm in the moment of the interaction. Yeah, I'm in yeah, the yeah. I mean I'm in the doctor's waiting room, waiting for the doctor to come in, right? And in this interaction moment, I, I get the payload of both the tangible value that I've been yeah, seeking, yeah, a physical yeah. thing that I can hold, see, touch, you know, whatever, as well as the emotional value of I'm exhausted, I'm excited, I'm tired, I'm frustrated, whatever. But both that, that yep. tangible value realization in the moment of the interaction and the emotional yes. and yes, the imprint of memory yes. Yes. in my head yes. that builds the basis of what I think or about you or if I'd ever refer you again. And then finally, after the whole yep. episode is over, if I'm asked to consider would I do this again, what I recommend, it's only then that I truly appreciate the value perception that's been generated and whether mm-hmm. or not I thought that was a good or bad experience. Right. Because oftentimes it just falls into my, yeah. my intellect. But well, and that's because you're also very present <clears throat> in the absolutely. moment. Absolutely. And, and, and throughout this entire interaction, right, yeah. there's two clocks going on. There's chronos time that's measuring, yes. you know, yes. I can't believe I've been on hold for seven minutes. This is the worst experience. I cannot. I, Britney Spears again, for the love of God, versus, you know, Kairos time, which is like, you know, yeah. think back five years ago when United bumped you off that flight and how pissed off you still are about it, right? And it's more of that life moment time. Mm-hmm. And this event was so extraordinary, whether positive or negative, mm-hmm. that it's still memorable. It's in, it's, it's in your conscious, ready to tell the story about. But well, there's, I mean, yeah, there's a, yes. Value Gates has, has been a pursuit of mine for a while. Right. This, uh, I like, I like that expression and it seems to fit, you know, what they're, what they're trying to point out. I think also, that interactional space uh, for a while what i deter- called it was uh, value diminishing patterns of interaction and value creating patterns of interaction because i think then you can start to model uh if you want <laughs> the um what's going on in those interactions over time and to have it be be between uh you and other people and and as you said between you and a machine and i mean all of those interactions add up Right, that's the basis of experience. Absolutely, um, and um, uh, and we all know what a value diminishing experience is like, right? But what what is it moment by moment? We try to to track this through a client contact uh, at IBM through a um, a client engagement, where uh, in the end the client left the contract before anything bad had come out about it, uh-huh. you know? So they hadn't really reflected on it. They, I mean, they reflected on it internally, but they didn't do that with the, with the customer or the client at all. And IBM was sort of curious how that happened. And it's like, well, look, if you're tracking the interaction, you would have, you would have noticed. True. And, and one of the mantras that the consortium taught me early on was every interaction is an opportunity to learn and improve yeah. the next interaction. Yeah. And you can only do that if you're writing stuff down. Yeah. Also, exactly. <clears throat> right. right. And we, now yeah. we have things that have fail. Right. Yes. <laughs> also, every crisis is an opportunity to prove that you're trustworthy. And without a sure. crisis, you're right. just another average runner. Right. So, so I don't know that you're really trustworthy until something has broken, something has happened, and I see how you respond. Yeah. 
right? Because otherwise you're like, hey, trust me, trust me, things are going to be great, and then things break, and then you don't. Right. And as and as you navigate through a, a, a value gate, right, you're 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 confronted with an expectation. I'm perceiving this gate. I have an expectation of what's going to be on the other side as I navigate through it. If my expectation doesn't resonate and match what I thought I was promised, then we're at a failure to continue the the interaction. And the next gate has to be smart enough to understand and accommodate lost souls. I went down the wrong path. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. How can I quickly and safely navigate to where I want to go and what I want to do? And if it doesn't accommodate that, and if I feel forced and locked into it, the emotional anger and frustration is going to, going to generate. And I'll have a 20x memory booster to this event versus only a 5x positive booster if you did it well. Mm -hmm. You Actually, know, that brings up the notion of um, octopuses and octopi, mm -hmm. octopi and and cognition, uh, mm -hmm. which a book or things that I mentioned before in this in this in this context. But uh, the the I keep reading this in different places. Well, to Carl Friston, the one I mentioned before, but it's this business of cognition being shared across species in terms of, I think I, consciousness bothers me, but, but sort of trying to unpack cognition doesn't. <laughs> and, but as, as uh, when your, your expectations are defied, uh -huh. right? Then you sit up and take notice and then you start to think, and then you, uh, you know, get disturbed or whatever. And it's, that's a really critical moment. It would be interesting to know if, you know, um, I guess that would be, uh, I mean, that could happen at any point once you've entered the gate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Wait, no, so I, will you say more really about octopi yeah. and cognition? Because that, that is not, I am not familiar. <laughs> it's not on your, on your syllabus? <laughs> no. <laughs> I kind of need okay, it to be. Because so it's it's on the know. menu, but not on the syllabus. That's yeah. the problem. You're having calamari, but you're not thinking about their intelligence. <laughs> right. Octopi share this problem with pigs. They're, they're tasty and smart. Yes. Yes. Now I don't know if I can eat them anymore. That's I know. I know. It's so hard. I don't want to ruin that. Yeah, so. maybe don't tell me then. Okay, no. So there's a, well, I, I first became aware of this in a book by Peter Godfrey Smith, who's a philosopher. Um, and I can't remember the name of the book, but I'll get it in a minute. Uh, but he asks the question, you know, has, has evolution discovered co consciousness more than once? Which is a nice question. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, so here's he goes book. back way far in the evolutionary tree because w to find things that uh, animals, plants, whatever, we think are really smart. Uh, and he, he lands in the uh, species of cephalopods because we all know, we all think they're very smart and we're becoming more and more aware of how, just how they seem intelligent. What is that, right? And one of the things that we share is this, this visceral response to what's not expected and then take action. Ooh. And when you think about that, at least as I've been thinking about that, um, even in its most simple form, it just starts to open up a whole different space of, you know, we would need to understand our expectations, Ooh. right? So what is the customer? Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> no, <laughs> what customers are we, great. What are, Consumers but what are the we, word I don't like. Yeah, I know. So, uh, but Let let's talk apologize. about this, this conversation. So we might go back to Matt, who is new here this week. And um, if his expectations are being met or exceeded all that rest of that stuff, as we go along, that's sort of great. And if he doesn't, then that could mean that could mean a whole lot of things, right? But I think expectation is, is something that is far more variable. You know, a lot of people come to this conversation with different expectations, I'm sure. Well, I, and, I, and I think expectation when, if, I, if I'm, you know, you live your life on autopilot so much of it and you're just, you know, going through the paces or whatever. Um, but if 
found him, I found him in the middle of an interaction and suddenly, hey, let's talk about your expectations. What, what's the lead? Yeah, what? Well, well, you can't because you, you don't. Whole beautiful yeah. paper conversation, right? Right. I think there's some evidence that in a couple of conversations that I'm in that the that the expectations are actually um, at a lower level of cognition. Yes. Right. And that's interesting, too, because we know how much goes on that we're not aware of. And that we, you know, we can reflect on our amygdala, <laughs> that when the amygdala speaks, um, we can notice that it spoke. And, yep. and take action. But if you don't, it's just, it's just so fast and so fleeting. And to live your life in a conscious way that you're always listening curiously for, you know, the, the universe to wink at you. Yeah. And it's far <laughs> easier like to that. jump into that moment yeah. versus I just, I just got to get through the day. I just have to get through the next three hours. Yeah. Well, that, that has its own dangers. I tend to live my life now that I'm not working in a formal organization that way a lot more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Mark or Dave or Bo or um, April, if you want to jump in, we'll just go quiet for a second. If you want to throw something into the conversation. I mean, this one might be wrote. I don't know. Is that, is, have people re already read Rushkoff's new book? the um, team human or whatever it is. I, I saw him talk the other day and some of it had to overlaps, I think, with these ideas. But one of the things that struck me was he was talking about how in the old days, stock investments were meant to help build the company. And now, you know, the company exists to pump up stock value. And right. I was thinking we've got a couple of times where we've, you know, like it feels like in this conversation, the, the premise is, flopped, you know, and, and we're doing the reverse of what was originally set out to be. Uh, I just thought that was an interesting one. Well, and that's part of the danger of going meta all the time, I think. I mean, so when, you know, my question is, to what extent it is, I mean, to go back to April's discussion about curiosity and what, you know, people trying to actually introduce children to the notion of curiosity and so on and so forth, where where I think I, I would like it if somebody <laughs> could figure out a way to assess that versus what it is to support and and um, and you know nurture curiosity uh, as it as it occurs. I stuck a few links into I don't know I don't know April if curiosity and creativity are the same or exactly what the relationship is, but I did stick, there was a, a conversation that I was involved in a couple of weeks ago that was interesting to me because he, he was talking about a creativity crisis and the decline in creativity. And I stuck some links to research and stuff in the, in the chat, but it was, you know, the research is from like 2011, 2012. Yeah. Jerry, Just because it was bad a long time ago doesn't right? mean it's not true. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've heard, I don't have the answer, um, but, at this point, what I've mostly heard and what how I prefer to tee things up is that curiosity and creativity are related but separate. So, um, you know, sort of hand in glove, and you can be very, very curious. And I tend to think that if you if you have one, you tend to score okay in the other, so to speak. But when you think about people who are wildly, wildly creative, they also just have their their gifts, their skills might be just as a creative, as a designer, as a, you know, how are we thinking about that? And that's different than being curious. Um, but, you know, I look at them kind of working together. Well, and this guy was distinguishing between innovation and creativity, mm -hmm. which I, I thought was mm -hmm. like innovation. I think it was a little bit of marginal change almost, you know, tweaking where yeah. creativity would, tended to be more dramatic. I don't know. That, that was the distinction that I thought was helpful. Yeah. Great. Interesting. Um, Long ago, I did a presentation where I um, distinguished different kinds of innovation, building from the innovator's dilemma, <clears throat> where they talked about sustaining and disruptive innovations. But I, I, I invented, I think, a term I called defensive innovation, which is when the disruptive innovation is on the horizon and you kind of see it, and you're the legacy, you're the incumbent, uh, you will do, you will in innovate a ton to make sure that little sucker doesn't take you out. And often you fail, but you will innovate like crazy. 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and this a lot of this is legal defenses like IP over protection, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other things. But um, but th th that's a form of innovation too. So innovation isn't always good, right? Which is something I learned um, from from Esther long ago when she was editing my my writing. She's like, uh, this is innovative. Okay, fine, great. D stop using that word. Like, is it helpful? Like, how's it going to affect us? Whatever else. <laughs> so on the topic of nurturing curiosity or create or creativity i'm not sure which this does but but it occurs to me um years ago i read the first 20 pages of how to talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk and and got just enough out of it that apparently i put it down and never went back but the the <laughs> tip here was which i use all the time um and has greatly improved tons of conversations that i have with my kids and without um the tip is uh, when, so for example, it's, it's like the yes and thing in, uh, in um, improv. So my kids are like, oh, can we go to you know, McDonald's for dinner or whatever? Uh, well, no, we can't because I've got dinner in the oven or whatever. But instead of no, we can't, the response is, oh my God, wouldn't that be awesome? I think we should go to every McDonald's and get a milkshake at every single one, right? You, it's the it's the yes and mode of of saying like I totally hear what you're saying that would be amazing. We're still not going to do it, but like what if we take it and blow up that idea, right? Like maybe oh then then maybe we should do set up a milkshake taste testing situation this summer or maybe mm -hmm. right like it it <clears throat> instead of it it really made me think about how often I shut things down right because it's not. Uh, reasonable or not in the plan or not as opposed to being like oh right this is a little bit goes back to curious and critical like what if we did what if we did go to McDonald's what if we went and got fries from every single fast food restaurant we could find right like mm -hmm. not it's not gonna happen today but there's a, there's a creative yeah. version would be what if we go build a better McDonald's or something like that totally yeah, yeah. what yeah. Would we, if we owned a McDonald's what would we serve or would, right? like whatever Kelly you're just there's a gonna be oh mom yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It always ends in, oh, mom. Right. Um, there, there's a therapeutic approach that, that does exactly what you're just describing, Kelly. It takes whatever's being presented, and instead of pushing or denying or deflecting or distracting or whatever, pulls and says, let's go with that. Oh, interesting. And let, let's go with what you just said and then see if whatever uh, is going on. April, you are unmuted. So the example that I used uh, last weekend giving this keynote, it was more in the q and I didn't, I, I knew that I was wading into tricky waters, but um, I used the example of Fortnite. And I was like, okay, how many people, you know, and a collective groan amongst the teachers. Fortnite, oh my God, please no. But as Jerry had wisely advised me, like these Fortnite lobbies, like kids are actually hanging out in these lobbies and they're learning stuff. They're learning all kinds of stuff. So that's interesting in and of itself. It's its own little classroom, which teachers have no control over. But I said, you know, rather than bashing students for playing too much Fortnite, simply start by saying, what is it about Fortnite that you like so much? And then dive deeper and deeper. And not that the goal is for them to play more, but to, to acknowledge their curiosity is there, but you know it's going to lead you to lead them into some greater, you know, skill set it ends up, and maybe it's, you know, I like the graphics, maybe it's, I like the, the dynamic, the, you know, dynamic, social dynamics, I like the whatever, whatever, but like, that's one of those things you need to flip it on your head, flip it on its head, and recognize that it can be an angle in to learn about much, much more. Yeah. So. I'm sure that must be something that, you know, gets taught to teachers, and then like parents, they are <laughs> in the situation, lose it. But yes, that's, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to our 90 minutes. We're, we're, we have another seven minutes by my clock. Um, so any wrapping thoughts? You don't have to say them in wrap, but just <laughs> like any concluding thoughts or any questions for further inquiry for, uh, we can set up a separate call. I mean, the whole idea is that we have one check-in call per month, but anybody who poses a question on the Rex conversational list or, or whatever else, uh, we can easily set up another, another call uh, around some of the topics that come out of here. So just, uh, just say so and, uh, and I'll do it. But uh, any thoughts as we, as we near the end of this call?
Uh, this is Matt. I would uh, mean just impression. It definitely is interesting discussions and ones that make me think. It does make it harder for me to think I should just go respond to all those emails this afternoon, even though I have to. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it, it was uh, something I'll be digesting and probably talk to Kelly and Brad about a little bit <laughs> as I digest it. Cool. Welcome to the posse. Yeah. And, and feel free to ask anything on the list and uh, Great. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how, that's how we work. But yeah. It's sort of this is a lovely confluence of experiences and interests and all that and pretty much whatever we drag into the middle of the of the space we create somebody's got something interesting to add to it or build on it or, or whatever it's it's lovely that way. Any other thoughts anybody else. Uh, ways of sharpening our inquiry I, I, I earlier had put um, the word inquiry up on the. Uh, I was actually trying to find the kind of therapy that pulls, uh, but let me just go over to inquiry because this is a word that's also right next to curiosity um, and creativity. And there's appreciative inquiry, there's context, action inquiry is a, is a thing. Um, there's a uh, Lane Kelly Chase uses action inquiry to work on complexity. This is a recent talk I think I just watched. Um, which makes the question, it sort of makes the statement, the process you use to get to the future is the future you get. That's interesting. So mm. part, partly, I think what we're saying here about curiosity is also about how we go about investigating the things that matter to us, mm. right? And, and the process dictates in some cases the outcome because if you have a five-step model that you're always going to put everything through, chances are things that don't fit your five-step model are just going to fall on the floor. They're just not, not going to make it, uh, make it out the door. So I think part of the question here is um, how, do we, how do we manage process so that we maintain enough looseness and time for curiosity and exploration and still get the job done in an era post re-engineering and, you know, uh, post the 90s and the, and the knots where we basically got rid of all the assistants, all the middle managers, everybody's got 130% of their responsibility on their plate, uh, too many meetings, too many reports, too much of everything to do, and not enough time to look up and decide which third of all that to get rid of because it's actually not contributing to anything, right? We're, we're just sort of doing a lot of these meetings and reports and things because we've done them for 10 years. Um, and somebody's must need them, otherwise we wouldn't have them on the list or Eh, what's up? And, and some companies take radical, you know, approaches to this, which is um, there'll be no meetings before noon on any day, or all meetings have to happen only on Thursday, or, uh, you know, these, these hours are sacrosanct uh, for everybody in the company so that people can actually sit and, and work on one task without interruptions, like no calls, no, no, no whatevers. Um, so I, I think some of this points back toward process and how we approach things. And, uh, organizations don't tend to reward these days anything that doesn't appear to be heading straight toward the bottom line. There's, there's this insane pressure across management everywhere I look for, hey, that doesn't sound like it's going to contribute to the bottom line right now. We can't do that. We don't have the, the slack to do it. You're not seeing anybody who's, who's making decisions based on sort of their mission and vision? Um, Just like one or two examples, Jerry. No, no, no. Uh, so I didn't say that they're not living up to their mission. I thought I sort of was making the argument that they're not leaving much breathing room for curiosity and exploration. Oh, sorry, I've got the. <laughs> let me get that. I'll be right back. <laughs> Along when Jerry was talking about, um, is anyone? Uh, I'm always in the investing world, so. Uh, Warren Buffett invested in this thing called 3G Capital, which is a Brazilian private equity company who just lost about $18 billion in Kraft Heinz. Yikes. And what 3G Capital excelled at and what the raison d'etre was, was the bottom line. They didn't innovate. They didn't invest in, the, in any kind of changes. They just did cost-based zero budgeting. Oh, so wow. if you want to look back, it's only in the last couple of weeks 
Warren Buffett's sitting there eating crow about it. And if you really look at it, what you're looking at is a company that made no investments whatsoever, just did cost control. And wow. that's, so Warren Buffett's got egg on his face for this stuff too. Wow. Is he admitting it? Yes, he's totally admitting it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great business case for anybody out there. Just look it up, 3G Capital, Kraft, uh, uh, Kraft and Heinz Ketchup. And you know what they did, I mean, they were so obsessed with that. You think about it, you go in a grocery store now, they, they were counting on everybody just wanting to have you know, Heinz Ketchup when millennials don't give a damn. I mean, people just want, but, so they missed organic, they missed all, the, all that stuff. So anyway. That's awesome. That is awesome. But there was a time when Heinz was actually, you know, huh? better, <laughs> in quotes, <laughs> than some other things like ketchup. Well, early consumer goods and consumer packaging gave you standards, gave you a, a set of quality when before that, I mean, one of the first consumer brands is Cracker Barrel Cheese because before that you walked into a store and there was a barrel full of crackers and you, who, who knew where the crackers had come from or how, you know, how they'd gotten there. You dipped in and you took some crackers and they wrapped them up in paper and put some string around it and you went home with crackers. So all of a sudden you have a label, a brand, and the thing that looks the same from time to, from, from each time you come and visit and buy it. So it was, it was in some senses a great leap forward to have processed wrapped foods and all of that. Um, it set a, it set a bar. And then look what happened. Um, <laughs> so we've hit our time. Uh, any, any closing words, closing thoughts? I'm super stoked to learn a new word, collimate. I, I love this word. Um, it ties back to vector, which is the name of my company. So um, I, I like this whole idea of aligning the vectors and producing power for breakthrough coolness. So thank you for that. Part of what we're doing is seeking alignment on, on things, right? That's how we get work done. And then it used to be you just tell everybody to go that way. And then it turns out that for smart people doing, difficult, for doing complicated work, that doesn't work very well. Yeah, no. Um, so now it's like, all right, there's, there's a hill we've got to take. How are we going to do that? Yeah. And we've got to find a way to, to, to get to agreement on it. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you um, very much. See you on the list. See you Have next month. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Take care.